Welcome to a special Pollinator Week Beekeeping Today podcast. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey guys, Global Patties is proud to sponsor this special Pollinator Week of Beekeeping Today podcasts. Global Patties is a family-run business that has been operating for over 17 years. They manufacture protein supplement patties for honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties made with a time-tested recipe of natural ingredients, with or without real pollen, and they also make custom patties to meet specific requests. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Global invented and made popular the sandwich patty design, which simplifies the handling process for beekeepers. Keep your bees going strong all summer long by supplementing with Global Patties. You can find out more at their website, www.globalpatties.com. Hey, Kim. Well, we're certainly happy to have Global Patties back again as our uh, sponsored Pollinator Week podcast. They produce a great product. Thank you, Global. Well, today's episode wraps up our Pollinator Week series. When you talk about honeybees and making honey with them, whether as a hobbyist, sideliner, or commercial beekeeper, we know that pollination is where the money is. When I think of business reporting, I think of Bloomberg News, and Bloomberg Environmental has a new podcast called The Business of Bees. Today, we have the podcast host and producer, Adam Ellington, lined up for our final show of this Pollinator Week. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I've been kind of following... Uh... Uh, those podcasts. I'm up through three now, and there's going to be six by the time they're all done, and it'll be interesting to see where they're going yet. And uh, interesting that Bloomberg picked up on this subject. This isn't, uh, the environment isn't something that they're known for wildly. So I was glad to see them put some emphasis and and, uh, energy into this subject. (laughs) <laughs> I am too, and, and it's nice to hear a, a well-produced show about honeybees uh, now as a podcast, although I hope uh, people don't expect that level of production quality in our podcast, Kim. <laughs> I don't know. I think we do pretty good, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, well, so do I, but I think we're both biased. All right, well, let's, uh, let's, get him call, let's call him up on Zoom and, and talk to Adam. All right. <laughs> Hey Adam, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Thanks for making time to join us. Uh, join us today. Happy to be here. Glad you could make it, Adam. Yeah. So Adam, so just tell us. Uh, many of our listeners may not be listening to Bloom, uh, Bloomberg News or Bloomberg, or even be aware of Bloomberg Environmental. Uh, so please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, um, and w- w- what brought you to this series of podcasts. Yeah, I am. Um I am a uh, reporter for Bloomberg Environment, which is, uh, you know, a, a small team within the much larger company of Bloomberg. Uh, and unlike some of my colleagues uh, in, you know, other parts of the country, I don't necessarily report on on stocks and Wall Street as much. Uh, my beat is pesticides and environmental issues, and I also come from a background in. Um, Uh, business and economics reporting. I used to be a reporter for a show on public radio called Marketplace. And I I was also raised on a farm. So I have a lot of these issues swirling around in my head at all all times. And when we were talking about the idea of uh, doing a podcast for for our environmental team, you know, uh, several of us talked about, um, you know, the sort of bees as a topic and how how it's uh, been covered over the years since colony collapse was first reported on and a lot of us you know even though we cover these issues you know frequently we still have sort of had these gaps in our knowledge about well what does the science really say about colony collapse today and what role do pesticides play and how big is this industry and how important and you know that was the sort of uh initial idea and then from there, we we decided to go forward with a six part podcast, and to break it up into you know six distinct episodes covering you know the bee economy, the bee you know the economics of of farming and pollination and honey, and then also to talk about as I said some of these policy questions surrounding bees and bee die offs and what's being done to fix it. Well, it's it's been really fun to to listen and actually as a as a 
I'm a hobbyist, but as a hobbyist, listen to the, bee, uh, the business of bees, get some, some Bloomberg press as, as, you, uh, as you're able to yeah. do. Yeah, you know, we're, um, like I say, we're, uh, you know, Bloomberg is a very big company with a, obviously their core audience is, a, is you know, a lot of uh, people in, interested in business and economic news. But I will say our goal is to really make something that is easily uh, understood by a, a, a sort of layperson audience, something that could be interesting for beekeepers, such as many of, as, of your listeners, but also home gardeners, people who are just interested in environmental topics broadly, and, and also, you know, people who follow um, the, the, the comings and goings of large corporations. You know, for instance, in our, la- in our final episode, we'll hear from scientists at some of the largest pesticide co- uh, companies in the world, Bayer and BASF, talking about about their uh, research into bee health. And, you know, we, we talked to people at Burt's Bees and very large, you know, farmers and corporations. So it's, it's a, a real diversity of voices across the spectrum, everyone from the backyard beekeeper to the scientist to some very large corporations. That's that that is that is, that is a lot to cover in, in, in six six ep- episodes. I, I ass- assume you've left a lot on the cutting room floor. Yeah, I yeah. There, you know, that, <laughs> that's true for sure. We could we could probably do ten episodes easy, but the way we've generally broken down the episodes are: the first episode is is about the business of bees broadly, everything from as as I say, cosmetics and agriculture and pollination. Um, to industrial solvents and things like that. Um, and then episode two is a deep dive on the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. And then three is just about bees and agriculture specifically. You hear, hear a lot about the almond industry in that episode. And then four is uh, bees as a symbol for environmental issues. And are bees a good symbol? Are we, When we talk about saving the bees, what bees are we talking about? And then the last two episodes are uh, Varroa mites, uh, the, the bee pest episode, and then the last one is just about bees and pesticides. Wow. And that, that's, that's really good. I'm really looking forward. At, at the time of this recording, we haven't heard episode uh, five and six yet, but the first four have been well-produced and, and really good listening. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I bet. look forward. I look forward to the uh, last two, certainly. But uh, the first four it was interesting to note that uh, uh, you've talked to our friend John Miller a few times, and John has been with us a couple of times uh, on our podcast too. He seems to be a good spokesman for his part of the industry, uh, commercial pollination, and especially in almonds. Yeah, what a what a really nice guy and a and a, and a interesting character. <laughs> Someone who has got a lot of experience uh, in in commercial honeybees, uh, obviously, but but also uh, the California almond industry, and just you know, in, in in the story of his operation, you really see how much the industry has changed over the past forty years. His company is is called Miller Honey, and as he explained it to me, you know, we're uh, we started out as a as a honey production company that did a little bit of pollination services, and now pretty much. Uh, we're a pollination company that does a <laughs> makes a little bit of honey, and that's really the shift that you see uh, in, across the country with this the rise of this extremely valuable opportunity with pollination services. The other two things that John's that John has explored, and uh, we, we talked with him briefly about, of course, with not only pollination of being more important in this business, but it's uh, producing bees for other beekeepers. And and that too is coming to the fore in terms of being an important generation, financial generation source. And then is indoor indoor wintering. And I I don't know if you got into him got in, into that with him or not. But there's a science that's uh, really worth examining. I think, and uh, we had a lot of fun talking with him about it. Uh, but you were exactly right. John's a good example of where beekeeping has been and where it's going. Right, and you know, and this uh, the, the the indoor wintering is just the kind of latest example of the lengths that beekeepers have are being forced to go to 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 keep their numbers up 
over the course of a year, and particularly over winter, you know, when when you often see these large die-offs, um, you know, just the science, the R and D, the 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 effort and the trial and error that beekeepers are going to 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 really keep their numbers workable. Because if you're talking about losing fifty percent or greater, you know of your of your numbers year over year um, from die off that's a real hard number to to work with even if you are getting two hundred dollars plus per hive that's just you bump up against the limit of the cost that beekeepers can push on to their customers and so you see a lot of interesting work being done to figure out ways to prop prop bees up and make it easier for them because we, because as you know, there it, it's really hard for a lot of bees out there. You know, where they're getting worked pretty hard, and they're exposed to a lot. Well, they they are exposed to a lot, and and uh, like I said, I was I'm looking forward to your uh, upcoming show on pesticides because that's certainly part of the issue. L- let me go back to um, episode episode um, two here. I, I found it fascinating that you thought it important to talk about L. L. Langstroth. Yeah, I just thought, you know, he just stuck out for me as this kind of really interesting character <laughs> in the in the in the um history of of beekeeping and, you know, I just thought it was important to sort of have an episode where we just talked about Apis mellifera and how it was that we landed on the European honeybee as the bee for, you know, not only honey production but agriculture and then Langstroth obviously came around at a time when um, beekeeping, you know, um, he had this eureka moment, you know, that was this idea of bee space, you know, three-eighths of an inch. And then he took that idea and he put it in a box and allowed people to, you know, allowed beekeeping to really flourish. And and I think he's, his story was just so interesting, you know, being a, a Presbyterian minister and then kind of being... Um, diagnosed with seasonal depression, but instead of being prescribed some sort of, you know, tonic or, or, you know, uh, opium or whatever they had back in those days, uh, he, his doctors told him to, you know, go spend some time outdoors and, you know, and that's what he did. And that's how he got to observing wild honeybee colonies. And and from there, it just really, this eureka moment, which, which was uh, still, you know, in, in use all across the country and world today. Yeah. It's it's fun that uh, he he discovered the the, the B space and um, old AI root was kind of the Henry Ford of the B B industry and and kind of popularized the the mass production of B equipment. So it's yeah, I'm sure you guys know a lot more about that than I do. I just <laughs> um, I just think that this uh, you know there was a uh, uh, humans had been. Uh, you know, uh, had bees in, in one fashion or another for so long, but the uh, this idea that um, of finding a way to really exploit the full potential, the full hive potential of honeybees, was something that really reshaped beekeeping and and agriculture, obviously. And I think we're in another phase where we're really it, we're we're rethinking the relationship between bees and agriculture again. Mm. In the series, you raise some concerns gaining ground in the media, or perhaps especially social media, about honeybees and North America agriculture. There seems to be a tone by some that the honeybee is part of the overall problem of our industrialized agriculture. I guess I don't see it like that. I see the honeybee as the canary in the coal mine, or perhaps one of the canaries in the coal mine, and one of the first to feel the downside of all this, all the progress that we've made. Right. Well, you know, it's um, it's I think a a part of a a broader uh, puzzle where uh, farmers are have been moving pieces around, trying to um, trying to maximize their yield and in in efficiency and within their own operations. But we're also trying to feed more and more people and we've uh, all gotten used to having lots of, of different products available to us, you know, 365 days a year in the store. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's easy to sort of uh, say, well, we've, we've, we've lost our way or, or, you know, we're, we're destroying the environment, but it's a, uh, I think a, uh, just a, 
a, a kind of um, a cause and effect relationship that has has uh, really grown to the point where honeybees occupy a central part in that in that whole ecosystem, and we would like to maybe. Uh, in some cases, not rely on them as much as we do, but um, the farmers have sort of found that because of the way things are, it's it's harder to remove honeybees or to use them in different ways. And and there, are, I, I think there are a lot of people trying to figure out a way to um, rebalance their their operations, whether it's using more cover crops, planting these pollinator hedgerows finding different ways of using pesticides that are minimizing the exposure to bees and other pollinators. So there's, there is, there is that uh, element as well that is growing, I think. Yeah. A, a lot of what you just said, I think you can say the, the almond crop in California epitomizes almost all, everything that you just covered uh, when from soil and water and resources and bees and pesticides and the whole bit. And I want to, I want to, I want to do one thing, Adam, before I forget one of the people you were talking about, you were talking to, uh, in, in, uh, one of the segments had to do with the, the almond crop and he kept saying Ammon and, and, <laughs> and your question was to him is why do you say Ammon? And he, and he said, uh, well, just because, and did you, I don't know if you got an answer, but for, those listening who don't know the difference between almonds and almonds, it's to harvest an almond crop, a large machine grabs the almond tree by the trunk and shakes the L out of it. So you go from almond to almond. I'm not sure if you were aware of that. <laughs> well, that was my co- a question from my colleague, Tiffany Stecker, who <laughs> asked the, this one farmer, Mike Doherty, you know, why, what's the deal with almond, you know, and, um, I think he said, well, do you say uh, salmon for the fish? You know, uh, so he had a point there. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's one of those uh, introductory things. But to go back to the <laughs> almond crop, um, there's a lot of things that are going on with that that, like I said, epitomize all of the things, the pesticide issues that they have and the industrial crop size and the use of water and uh, all of the things that are I'm not going to say going wrong with agriculture, but are certainly stressing a lot of the rest of the environment due to agriculture showed up in that crop. I thought you did a good job of uh, pointing out a lot of them. Well, thank you. I, that's definitely something we sought to do. Um, you know, when I talk to almond farmers, you know, when we put some of these questions to them, I expected to get um, some something along the lines of, you know, uh, you know, we know what we're doing here. Um, you know, all these people who, uh, want to, you know, complain and moan about how we use pesticides really don't understand. Again, I grew up on a, on a fruit farm that, you know, I saw what happened when you would get brown rot starting in your, in your crop or when you would get peach tree borer. And, and I know that, you know, farmers are, they've got a lot invested in these, in these orchards and they, and they, you know, they they can't afford to lose a crop because they didn't apply an insecticide at the right time or a fungicide. And so, but what, what I heard is from farmers that resonated with me is, you know, Hey, we, we don't want, we don't want to kill the bees, obviously. Like we need the, the bees, we need the, the honeybees and the native pollinators. And if we spray at the wrong time and end up killing a bunch of honeybees, then the Beekeepers not gonna not gonna rent us the hives that we need so desperately to have, have a crop. So you know, hey, tell us what to do and we'll do it. Um, you know, they're and and moreover that they're using um, you know, they they want to use as, as little pesticides as they can. That's a cost that they have to incur. And so, I think you could look at a, at the almond in- industry as an example of. Uh, of a of a crop where where farmers are very much vested and interested in finding solutions to some of these problems they want they want it to be sustainable and and they can, and it can't be sustainable if they're killing all the bees well that's that's right uh, in earlier early in our pollinator week series we talked with Davy Hackenberg an east coast pollinator he talked about how one of his growers wrote him a check for what I think was a thousand dollars just because he wanted to make sure the bees were doing well. 
Your series also relates similar sentiment, uh, and I, I don't know. I agree. There, there is a good relationship between growers and beekeepers out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've, you're you're taking all the, the your biggest money making opportunity. Unfortunately, comes at a time when most most honeybees are are not active. You know, outside of you know the south and the and the um, in parts of the west. You know, where February most bees are are you know still snug. You know, they don't hibernate per se, but they're they're inactive inside their hives and um so to get all those bees active and out to california is no small task and then i think the real the 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 impact of that that also is really interesting to me is once you've got all those honeybees and they're done with almonds uh where do they go then and that's where you see bees turning up in a lot of other crops that maybe historically weren't as dependent on honeys or on honeybees for pollination but you know, the farmer can get a little yield bump by using honeybees or maybe a little insurance that the pollination will be a good one. Well, you bring up uh, you bring up the next interesting part of uh, the series that you did when you're talking about wild bees and the effect that they have. And um, I will use this word carefully, but the controversy are honeybees um, are detrimental, destructive to wild bee populations. Uh, there's a lot of discussion going on about that and, and the beekeeping industry and the conservationists and the, the people who are supporting the wild bee population are having some good discussions about are honeybees good in the environment, period. Yeah, I, I think that is a, it, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It is an interesting debate. Um, in, I think it breaks down you know, for me, it, it breaks down along the following lines, you know, honeybees, um, can compete with native bees for resources. For instance, if there was a, um, a movement for a time there to put honeybees out into national parks, um, which, uh, you can do. And, uh, but does that actually make sense? What's the point of that? I think the idea that, uh, the analogy that gets tossed out all the time is, you know, raising honeybees uh, to to save bees is is equivalent to, you know, say raising chickens to save birds. You know, um, be, uh, honeybees are an agricultural animal that we can replenish a, as we see fit. But you know, raising backyard bees or buying local honey or you know that's not going to help. Um, native bees and in some cases it's it may harm them if you're putting them in a in a place where they're in direct competition for resources and you could also extend that to agriculture in some cases where you know the you you bring in a large amount of bees all at once honeybees all at once to to pollinate the crops but you know the the native bees also need that floral resource and once the once it's gone, then if you don't have anything else on the landscape for them to feed on, well, then they're in they're in rough shape too. Yeah, it's an interesting balance, and and uh, I, I know it hasn't been resolved yet. There are ongoing uh, discussions on putting bees in national parks because it's the only safe place left. And you have uh, your as of today, your show hasn't covered the pesticide. Uh, discussion, but therein lies part of what beekeepers are looking at. Where can you go where pesticides aren't? And national forests, national parks tend to be one of the very few places left. So I don't know the answer to this, and I don't know when the discussion will end, but uh, it's certainly ongoing and things that people need to be aware of. It's strange to strange to think about, isn't it, that in this big country, we, we can actually ha- run out of space for, for for bees, you know that that really. When I heard people tell me that, I really kind of surprised me that that we could. It would be hard to find a place to to park your honeybees in the off season to to keep them safe. So from a from a, I'm, I'm not aware. I'm not fully versed in this in this argument. Is this is that national park national park lands or is that like the the national the federal lands? Uh, both. So and what's the yeah, difference? Reasons. What's the difference between me putting my cattle on federal land versus someone parking bees on land? 
I think the argument is would be, well, if you were putting your cattle on a national park where they were in di- direct competition for, you know, with with bison or antelope, and the bison and antelope suffered as a result of the presence of, of the cows, um, that's the problem or the analogy, I, uh, the, the issue that, that environmentalists point to is that if, you know, if these honeybees were any other species of animal, you know, and you were putting, introducing them a non-native species into a, into a public land where the native species were negatively impacted, um, then you would immediately say, no, we shouldn't do that. Um, people tend to forget that honeybees, um, are, are not native, uh, to, to North America and, you know, uh, in some cases can, can, can outcompete native bees. Well, the, uh, the, <clears throat> your comment just a moment ago about uh, hard to imagine there not being a safe place when you consider, but when you consider soybeans, corn and concrete, um, suddenly the available land gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So, uh, this isn't going to get any better. Uh, so resolution is going to have to come up somehow, somewhere. And I'm glad that you're exposing it to people who know. Yeah. We live with it every day. Beekeepers live with it every day. Every day I live with it, with my bees in my backyard. They're putting a new road in. Uh, it used to be a forest. Now it's a road. So um, <clears throat> I'm glad you're exploring that because uh, more people need to get involved. You also mentioned... Um, in one of your shows, the issues with urban beekeeping and how yeah. that's grown. Yeah, I think, uh, and we talk about that a little bit in episode four, um, and this idea that actually in places where you know where of uh, where there is a high amount of agriculture, say the Midwest, um, you know, urban areas can actually be a refuge um, from the surrounding agricultural landscape um, with a few changes to the way we think about public spaces and, and the way we keep our yards and our, you know, our parks and our grassy medians and things like that. We could, we could make a few uh, changes that would actually be quite beneficial to native bees and, um, and possibly create little, you know, oases for, for bees in the, in this larger agricultural landscape. So I think that's a, that's a really an interesting thing. And, you know, unlike a lot of environmental issues that are somewhat abstract or seem overwhelming, you know, climate change, what can I do about that? That, you know, with bees, you, here's, here's an issue. You, you can actually do something immediately. You know, you could, you could plant more flowers, native flowers on your land or, or, or stop mowing your lawn as much, uh, make a pollinator garden. You can actually do something that will, have an immediate impact on pollinator health. And cities can take that a step further. And uh, the, my city here in Medina is creating a, a boatload of small pollinator parks, they're calling them, uh, so that, you know, that's what they're doing. They're creating these oasis, I like that word, uh, for both native bees and honeybees in the urban environment. So. Uh, it can be done. It can be fixed. It can be changed. But uh, people need to be aware of it. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and then there's going to be some uh, research to figure out h- how much of an impact it has. But um, you know, it's an interesting thing to think about that the idea of cities being good habitat for bees. But um, you know, I I can tell you since I've started on this podcast, I've noticed all the bees on my tiny little property, and uh, <laughs> it's interesting to go around and see. Oh, you know what? You know where are these uh, where are these hoverflies coming from, and where are these uh, you know these these bumblebees? What is that? Is that you know is it Bombus pennsylvanicus? And a whole you know what are these? <laughs> What is this Apis mellifera doing on my holly holly uh, bush? You know that <laughs> someone must have a hive, and so you know it's it is quite fascinating. It opens up a whole new world, doesn't it? It sure does. Yeah, I can see how people could kind of nerd out, so to speak, <laughs> uh, getting interested in in documenting the hunt, the the bees they see or don't see, as the case may be. Welcome to our world. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let my freak flag proudly fly. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Well, the, the last I, um, the last show you talk about is agriculture. Kind of, a, you mentioned one of the ones is going to be on pesticides, and I guess we'll see where that goes. 
I'll be real interested when you start talking to the big company people. Well, you mentioned big agriculture is business. And um, can you give me a preview of what I can expect for that so we can give our, our listeners here a, kind of a heads up on why they should tune in? Well, I think, yeah, I can give you a, a preview. Uh, obviously, it's probably not going to surprise you that uh, companies that make pesticides feel that the pesticides aren't the leading cause for for insect and pollinator declines. Um, and they they have some science to to point to that, and we're gonna we're gonna get into that as well. Um, but they would say uh as would uh another you know a number of 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 entomologists that the the uh the issues impacting bee health today are are um are multifold and and there's no um one thing we could point to uh and say that is the main culprit um and if anything the one that people might point to the most would be varroa mites as a kind of a X factor that seemed to be impacting bee health across the board and how they respond to ex- things like exposure to pesticides. Um, but there's no doubt that using uh, mass quantities of pesticides on the agricultural landscape is, is creating an impact and particularly a uh, hot debate right now over the use of neonicotinoids um, and, you know, there's going there's there's two schools of thought on that but it's uh the science is frustratingly inconclusive <laughs> but there are um yes you know even if you don't buy that that pesticides are solely responsible for um for pollinator declines you could all one could also make the case and some do that that uh we still might be using more than we need to particularly with these neonic coated seed seed coatings that we you know are essentially the only seed you can buy now um but uh a lot of people really want to point the finger solely at pesticides and and i'm afraid that the science doesn't bear that out completely yeah that's an unhealthy mix definitely so adam i just wanted to ask how long have you been working on the, the series uh, we've really sort of been doing it now for about six months. Uh, we started doing recordings. Actually, I started, I interviewed a few beekeepers in, uh, my hometown area mm-hmm. in Northern Michigan, uh, last summer. Yeah. So about a year ago and then, um, uh, put that in the, in the hopper for a while. And then we really started again in earnest sort of at the beginning of the year at the American Beekeeping Federation meeting in January. And then, um, uh, we have been just sort of heavily involved in the production of the episodes for the past three months. So uh, it's been a big project for us, but it's been uh, very interesting and, uh, you know, a pleasure to speak with so many different uh, people. And, and uh, you know, it, for, as a reporter, anytime I can spend time out, out of the office, out in a field, <laughs> talking to farmers, I, I count that as a, as a win for sure. As a plus. One of the reasons I, I enjoy being a journalist. I, I'm jealous of your. I'm, I'm I'm jealous of your road time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I'd like to have more of it uh, for sure. But uh, you know, you you, um, a lot of a lot of interesting characters in farming, as you guys know, and a lot of good <laughs> stories, a lot of insights and knowledge, and uh, it's just a it's a thrill to uh, see those systems in work at work. So, what was the most surprising thing that you learned? during a time that may or may not have made it to the show? Um, you know, I just think um, the thing that I keep coming back to is just how significant the almond industry has been for the pollination economy. Um, you know, obviously almonds are a, a big crop and they're, people have been eating them for a long time and they're, uh, you know, uh, but I'd never really thought of almonds as being, um, playing the, such a huge role Uh in the in the pollination economy business where you know without almonds you would remove about 80% of or not 80% but you would re- you would make the 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 uh the whole business sort of not viable um the way it is today for instance after almonds you know the next crop you might get $40 40 or $50 per hive but almonds is 200 and just the 
amount of money that almond farmers spend to have their crops pollinated and the amount of money beekeepers make from that is is really something that struck me. And, uh, you know, I just don't, I hadn't been quite aware of how big this whole almond bee economy was together. And it's quite massive and growing still. It's the 500 pound elephant in our industry, without a doubt. Yeah, I think one uh, John Miller told me, or no, it wasn't John Miller, but one farmer told me that the projections were for two hundred thousand new acres per year, and so you you know you do the math, you know, two hives per acre. That's a lot more hives you need year over year at a time when when beekeepers are really struggling to to maintain their numbers, let alone grow them. And then you look at the the, the other things going on with almond growers. Where am I going to get the water? Indeed, indeed, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's it's it, it farming. It's not for the uh, faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> you have that exactly right. That's for sure, exactly right. I think that's why my parents got out of cherry farming when they did, is because it, it's uh, it's just no fun to uh, you know, put so much heart and soul and time into a crop and then you know have to to dump them on the ground because the the price is too low or to uh, have a good price and then a storm comes through and wipes you out or you maybe yep. don't have enough water. It's just a, uh, it's people, uh, I think a lot of people, particularly in cities like where I live, really I, I idolize farming and this is this romantic way of life, but uh, <laughs> I know firsthand <laughs> how stressful it can be. Oh, definitely. It is for everybody. Yeah, and beekeepers. Beekeeping yeah. is 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 farming as well. <laughs> well, we encourage you, yeah, and 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 listeners of your show to listen to this week's podcast. And uh, we have a West Coast pollinator uh, and East Coast pollinator. East Coast uh, being Davy Hackenberg talk about the struggles they have, and it's not all just two hundred dollars a hive. I mean, they have trucks are running, labor issues, drivers. Uh, equipment, bees, queens. I mean, it's, it's like you said, they don't have to worry so much about uh, the same issues that other growers have, but they are growers of bees and they have to keep them, those colonies strong for the time that they need them. And uh, it's stressful. It's, uh, I, Davey said, what it was he said, Kim, he, he likes being a beekeeper, but he likes bees, but not a bee and a beekeeper, something along those lines, just because of the uh, the challenges it's 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 stressful indeed it's a it's a tough way to make a living but uh uh i think adam now that you've been bit i think maybe you can see why people keep doing it um it'll be interesting to watch tell me adam where can i find this podcast uh you can find uh the, our podcast probably uh at the same places that uh, your listeners find your your podcast you know if you search business of bees in uh either the apple podcast library or stitcher or um spotify um or you can just go on the internet and search business of bees podcast and that'll direct you uh direct you to our page from there so it's it's pretty easy to find if you uh if you have a couple minutes just to, to look around. Okay. Good. We, highly, we highly recommend it. And I will have that in the show notes as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Adam. Really appreciate you being here today. I uh, appreciate your time and uh, input and the fact that you are taking our word and spreading it around the rest of the world. We appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. Happy to do it. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. That was good, Kim. I was really happy we could get Adam in on the show. I've really enjoyed the series. Uh, I've listened to all of them a couple times. Um, you know, they're 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 well produced, well edited. I wish I had the ability and the editors he had that we could come off and sound as good as as his series does. Um, but I was really happy he took the time to be on the show today and on such short notice. Well, I think we do a pretty good job, Jeff. All things considered. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to compare and contrast a whole lot. Good thing. Uh, one, one of the things that, uh, that, uh, I wanted to bring up after listening to this is, is that he was, he was putting some emphasis on the cost of almond rental, almond pollination yeah. rentals at $200 a hive. And as, as luxurious as that sounds, when you figure that's a box, one box of bees, $200, 
the bigger picture that you have to you absolutely have to look at is it costs that beekeeper two hundred and fifty dollars a year to keep that hive alive and to make it worthy of pollinating that almond crop. So that almond crop isn't isn't profit. That almond crop is is part of the cost of doing business, not even all of it. So um look at it that way also. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, well, when I look back at the the past five episodes on our special Pollinator Week series of podcasts, I think we've taken a wide look at pollination from the beginnings of Pollin- Pollination Week with Julie and Vicky from P2 and all the work that they are doing and all their other projects, to Davey Hackenberg as an East Coast beekeeper pollinator and, and to Gene Brandy as a West Coast beekeeper pollinator sitting in the middle of California's Central Valley. We've talked to Jennifer and the work and the research she's doing at the University of Tennessee and, and now today with Adam. I think we've painted a pretty good picture of pollination today and the importance of the honeybee in the United States and around the world. I learned more than I thought I would and I, I, when we sat down to build out this week, and I hope our listeners found our series as enjoyable as I did, as, as we did. It's been a good time. There's no doubt about it. Eye-opening in some occasions, uh, more of the same in other occasions, but more of the good same. And and uh, that we 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 hear this, we in the beekeeping industry hear a lot of this over and over and over again. And then we're talking to ourselves. What's good is that now, hopefully, some people, other people, are listening with the movies that we've done, or the movies that we covered. Now, this podcast that other people are beginning to. Be aware more of the thing. Be more aware of the things that are going on that we confront on a daily basis. So, uh, hopefully, we've uh, opened some eyes. Very good. Well, that about wraps it up for this podcast and this series of podcasts. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the podcast. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. We want to thank this episode's sponsor, Global Patties. Global Patties is a family-operated business which has been operating for over 17 years and manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And while you're there, give them a shout-out for sponsoring this great Pollinator Week series of Beekeeping Today podcast. Feel free to send us comments and questions to questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listeners. Anything else, Kim, before we sign off for this week? No, Jeff, just a quick thank you to Global Patties and a uh, good uh, high five to you for doing a good job on this one. Thanks. (laughs) Same to you, Kim. We'll talk to you soon.